teach us things you want us to know. And thank you for the Sabbath day, Lord. And ask for your forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Genesis. You know, I always had a problem with history. I hated it. <laughs> Even up until recently, I just don't want to know about the history. I don't care about it. It was in the past. It doesn't affect me. I live here and now, right? And I want to know what's going on in the future. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> history is important. And history is where we have a solid foundation to stand on. If we don't have a foundation, then, then we just have nothing, right? So I'm glad that I'm learning the history. And especially reading in the Bible, I always thought, man, there's so much history that doesn't matter to me. Well, it does. I'm learning how important it is to know where we come from and why we're here. Where your roots are. Yeah, where our roots are. And so I'm really excited to get into this quarterly with Genesis. And I'm excited to find out what we're going to learn this quarter. And so I'm going to start with the introduction here. I'm going to read what the author of this book has to say. Um, Genesis is the book of the beginning. And I wrote, as a side note, it's the book of the who, the what, the why, the where, and the how. So let's see what he says here. Genesis is about Jesus. Jesus, our creator. Jesus, our sustainer. Jesus, our Redeemer, writing millennia after the Genesis text itself had been penned by Moses and reaching back across those ages to the patriarch's very words, the Apostle John reveals Jesus in the creation account. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. John 1, 1 through 4. What did John write here in the beginning? All things that were made, all things that once didn't exist, come into existence by Jesus. All creation from galaxies hurling across the cosmos and scattering pinwheels of fire and light to the meticulous DNA woven miraculously into the cell to quantum waves, Jesus created and sustains it all. And the book of Genesis is the first story in scripture of both this creation and the redemption of this creation. Here in this book is the world's only official account of our origins. The English word Genesis is derived from the Greek Genesis, which means beginning. Itself derived from the Hebrew Bereshit in the beginning. The first word of the book, hence, the word from the entire Bible, the first word of the entire Bible, Genesis gives us the foundation, the base upon which all of the following scriptures rest. Because it is first, and so foundational to all that comes after, Genesis is probably the most quoted or referred to book in the rest of the scriptures. Our world's first 2,000 years is wrapped up in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So it's a really condensed version of our history, but it's an important one. Genesis is important because it is the book that, more than any other work anywhere, helps us to understand just who we are as human beings, a truth especially important now in a day when we humans are deemed as nothing but accidents. Chance creations of a purely materialistic universe. Or, as one physicist put it, we humans are organized mud. <laughs> That's a sad description, which to some degree is true, though for him, the law of nature alone organized it. Genesis, however, reveals to us our true origin, that we were beings purposely and perfectly made in the image of God in a perfect world. God created us, he formed us. Genesis also explains the fall, that is why our world is no longer perfect and why we as humans aren't as well. Genesis, however, also comforts us with God's promise of salvation in a world that in and of itself offers us nothing but suffering and death. With its dramatic stories of miracles, creation, births, and, rain, and the rainbow, that's a miracle, and judgments, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, 
those were judgments against the sin. Witnessing to God's holy presence, Genesis is awe-inspiring. But Genesis also is a book with moving human stories of love. Jacob and Rachel, of hatred, Jacob and Esau, of birth, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, of death, Sarah, Rachel, Jacob, Joseph, of murder, Cain, Simeon, and Levi, and forgiveness, Esau and Jacob, Joseph and his brothers. There's a lot of stories and history, but they're just people like us. But God wanted us to know about them. It also is an instruction book with these lessons of ethics between Cain and Babel, on faith, Abraham and Jacob, and on the hope and promise of redemption, the crushing of the serpent, and the promised land. During this quarter, not only will we read and study the book of Genesis, but we will also enjoy its beautiful stories and learn to walk better with the Lord of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Meanwhile, the geographical movements of the book, from Eden, Eden to Babel, to the promised land, to Egypt, to the prospects of the promised land, remind us of our nomadic journeys and nurture our hope for the real promised land, the new heaven and the new earth. As we follow these characters across the pages of Genesis, we will discover that regardless of how different the time, place, culture, and circumstances, often their stories are in many ways ours as well. So we really haven't changed much, but we can learn from their stories. You know, like our parents always try to teach us, learn from their mistakes. The Bible's trying to teach us to learn from them. So that was the introduction and then on to the Sabbath um, lesson one. And it's titled, The Creation. Our memory text for today is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And Chip, a while back, had a comment on that in the beginning. And I know you'd like to say something on that. <laughs> right, the beginning of our existence, because the universe was created way before we were, right? Yeah, yeah that's correct. It's... Um it's a mistaken understanding many times when people read the, the Bible when it says, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. And then it, then it says, but the earth was here, it was formless and void. So there's a contradiction there. It could be. But in reality, it's not. In the beginning, as you said earlier, Jesus, but he was in his pre-incarnate state as God in the heavens, so it was Jehovah Yahweh who was responsible for creating all things, seen and unseen. Now, that means all things that we don't even see and all the things we do see. But the question is not, the question is not stated as to when this happened. The answer to the when is in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When was that? We have no idea when that was. And the Bible doesn't tell us when it was. Then, in verse 3, it talks about the creation of human life and animals and plant life on this planet that was already here. Yep. Now, that's the correct understanding of looking at Genesis 1. There's a time gap. There should be a comma in there. Well, and here's a quote that I found from uh, Spirit of Prophecy in this regard because it brings up something. And it's this, that we are not the center of God's creation. We as humans are not the center. And usually when people understand creation, they look at it from a, a human-centric point of view. It's always about me. Mm -hmm. You know, God created everything that day, even the stars and the sun. no. The sun was here, the stars were all here, all the planets had been created previously. Now listen to this quote. This is in Patriarchs of Prophets, page 41. God's government inclu included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of all the worlds that he had created, previous to creating earth, mm -hmm. life form on earth. And Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels of heaven with him in rebellion, he could carry also all the worlds that God had created. 
So the inhabitants of heaven and of the worlds, being unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin, could not then have seen the justice of God in the destruction of Satan. Mm -hmm. He had to let it run its course yeah. and prove. Right, to all the other inhabited worlds that he had created in the time in time past, in the eternity. They're I mean, watching it play because out. Because there's he's a creator God. There has never been a beginning of, of God. He's always been. Yeah. And he and it's believed that he's always been creating. Are we the last planet that he created on? It it's it's a natural conclusion that that would be true. There is no creation account. It, there is no other creation account listed or spoken of after our creation. Right. So we are a special creation to the Lord because he created us in his image. We'll get more into that. Now, just one yeah. more thing to keep in mind here. And that is a discussion of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day of creation, what God had done. There, this quote here also, and then this will be the end of this, of my input here, but <laughs> the... This is what now this is a couple quotes here. The sun was already present prior to the fourth day of creation. In the work of creation, when the dawn of the first day broke, um, the first week was just like every other week. Now, and why am I this is so important to our study? Uh, the first week was just like every other week. The great God, in his days of creation and day of rest, measured off the first cycle as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. When the Lord declares that he made the world in six days, he means the day of 24 hours, which he has marked off by the rising and the setting of the sun. So the first day was marked off by the rising and the setting of the sun, a 24-hour period. The fourth day was when God set the universe in order and the earth to it so that it would mark off seasons and times in relation to the North Star and all the other constellations, okay? But it, the sun was already here, had been previously created by God, who mm -hmm. is Jehovah. So we have our weeks established. We have our months established by the moon. Right. The and cycle the, of the, the moon. Import, and the importance of the seven-day literal 24-hour period day is that God does, has never expected us to do something that he wouldn't himself have done, and that is this. He worked six days, 24-hour periods, and then rested on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Okay? And now to add to this one more thing, the, the whole creation, and, and including the fall of man, is part of redemption history as seen in creation. In other words, the whole purpose of creating was to reveal how God is going to redeem us mm -hmm. from the beginning, yep. before he even fell. Good, good input right there. Thank you. All right. Um, the book of Genesis, and hence the whole Bible, begins with God's act of creation. This fact is very important because it means that our creation marks the beginning of human and biblical history. This truth also implies that the Genesis creation story has the same historical veracity as other events of human and biblical history. The two creation texts in Genesis 1 and 2 contain lessons... <coughs> excuse me. About God and humanity, as we study this week, we will understand better the profound meaning of the seventh-day Sabbath. We will ponder God's act of creating humans in his image and out of the dust, too. We will be intrigued by the purpose of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, and by its connection with the tree of life. The most important lesson of the biblical stories of the beginnings is a lesson on grace. Our existence is purely an act of grace. God is created the heavens and the earth while humans were not yet present. Just as our creation was, our redemption is, too, a gift from God. And how profound it is that both concepts, creation and redemption, exist in the Seventh-day Sabbath commandment. We're going to learn about that, I think, on Wednesday's lesson. No, Tuesday. So let's move on to the Sunday lesson, the God of creation. It says, read Psalm 100, 1 through 3. Does anybody want to read that? Psalm 100, 1 through 3. Sally said she could.
Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know you that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amen. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless him. I just mm -hmm. see friendship here, too. When I read those books, I, I see it that way. I see that God wants to be our friend, and mm -hmm. um, we belong to him. And we haven't made ourselves, so we have to depend on him. But do we? You know? He wants a relationship with us. Yes. Okay. So, so it says, the question, what is the human response to the God of creation and why? <coughs> what is our response? We should approach him with joy, joyfully, with gladness, with praise and thanksgiving. Our response should be to serve him with gladness and praise him with song. Mm -hmm. Get up there and play. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoy it when you do. <laughs> it's definitely uplifting. So in Genesis 1, the first message of the creation account is God. We hear it in the translation, in the beginning, God. In the first line, Genesis 1-1, the word God is placed in the middle of the verse and is underlined by the strongest accent in the Hebrew litur litur liturgical <laughs> sorry, traditional chanting in order to emphasize the importance of God. The creation text begins then, and an emphasis is on God, the author of creation. The book of Genesis begins, in fact, with two different presentations of God. The first creation account in Genesis 1, 1 through 2 and 4, presents God as infinitely far from humans and trans the transcendent God, Elohim, whose name speaks of the supremacy of God. The name Elohim denotes preeminence and strength, and the use of the plural plural form of the word Elohim expresses the idea of majesty and transcendence. The second creation account, which is in Genesis 2, 4 through 25, presents God as up close and personal. God, the, the imminent God Yahweh, whose name many believe denotes closeness and relationship. So the first, the Elohim, is preeminence and strength. And the second, when you see the tetragrammaton Yahweh, means up close and personal. And so right, I want to add one statement here, because you, you went over it kind of quick. The word Elohim is plural, meaning more, more than, than one. one. You have your triune, you have the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And, right. Yep. Okay. I, I knew I should have touched on that. <laughs> Good point. So the creation text as a whole is then an implicit appeal to worship God. First, to be aware of God's infinite grandeur and power, and at the same time to acknowledge our dependence on him because he created us and not we ourselves, as we just read in Psalm 103. This is why many of the Psalms often associate worship with creation. Um, this twofold view of a God who is both majestic and powerful and who is also close, loving, and in a relationship with us, makes an important point about how we should approach God in worship. Awe and reverence go along with joy and the assurance of God's proximity, forgiveness, and love. See Psalm 2 and 11. Even the sequence of the two presentations of God is meaningful. The experience of God's proximity and the intimacy of his presence allows the experience of God's distance. Only when we have realized that God is great, shall we be able to appreciate his grace and enjoy in trembling his wonderful, loving presence in our lives. So I wanted to say here, just to, to kind of show how big and God is, the three words in the beginning, actually the whole scripture, um, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that first sentence, God existed before he created the beginning, which is time. 
he existed before he created the heavens, which is space, and he existed before he created matter, the earth. He created time, space, and matter. And scientists are still trying to figure that out. <laughs> so I want to read, get, go to Isaiah 40, 25 through 26. Where did it go? Here we go. 20, Isaiah 40, 25 through 26. If anyone has that. Get Isaiah 40, verse 25 and 26. I'm still finding it. There we go. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incompatible, incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Isn't that amazing? The scientists have kind of figured out there's like 400 billion what, stars and galaxies, and, and he knows them all by name. Think about that, you know? I mean, I've seen some of the names that we've given the stars, and they're just numbers with a letter, but he gives them a name. You know, each, he knows them all. And then let's go to Psalm 147.4. Psalm 147.4. If I can get there faster, I'll read it. <laughs> and my voice gets hoarse once in a while, so I like it whenever the other people read. Psalm 147, 4 is towards the back, and the verse says, He counts the number of the stars, he calls them all by name. And then I want you to go to Matthew 10, 30. Matthew 10, verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I don't have many in my hair. <laughs> but he knows. He knows even when a sparrow falls. So when you lose a hair, he knows about it. <laughs> so just amazing that God, who's so big in the universe, numbers all the stars, knows the number of hairs on your head. Now to me, that means that he gets up close and personal. You know what I'm saying? He he's, wants intimate closeness with you, a loving relationship. And even though he's way out there, he's right here. And I think that's, that's an awesome thing to know. And that makes you want to worship him too. You know, just Leonard over here wants to say something. Well, speaking of numbering the stars and the hairs in our head, it reminded me of a, a little plaque I saw on somebody's wall at one time that any fool can count the number of, se number of seeds in an apple, but only God knows how many are apples in the seed. Amen. That seed can plant a tree, and then what? <laughs> that was a good, good quote. So we know that God is a loving God. He wants a relationship with us. He's our creator. And so the question on the bottom says, think about the vast power of God who upholds the cosmos and yet can be so near to each of us. Why is this amazing truth so amazing? And I think I answered that right there. He's a very loving creator. Anybody else have any comments? or? Okay, questions? We can move on to Monday's lesson. Monday's lesson is titled The Creation. And there's a lot of scripture but Genesis 1, 4, 1, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31, and then Genesis 2, 1 through 3. What is the significance of the refrain, it was good in the first creation account? And what is the implied lesson contained in the conclusion of creation in Genesis 2, 1 through 3? So at each step of the creation account, God evaluates his work as tav. It means good. 
It is generally understood that this adjective means that God's work of creation was successful and that God's observation that it was good means that it worked. The light was illuminating, Genesis 1 through 4, Genesis 1 verse 4. The plants were yielding fruit, Genesis 1 12 and so forth. But this word referred to more than the efficiency of a function. The Hebrew word tov, it feels like an echo, also is used in the Bible to express an aesthetic appreciation of something beautiful. It also is used in contrast to evil, Genesis 2, 9, which is associated with death. So it was good means that it worked, it was beautiful, and it was not evil. It was good. The phrase, it was good, means that the creation was working nicely. That's better. That it was beautiful and perfect and that there was no evil in it. The world was not yet like our world, affected by sin and death, an idea affirmed in the introduction of the second creation account. See Genesis 2, 5. This description of the creation radically contradicts the theories of evolution, which dogmatically declared that the world shaped itself progressively through a succession of accidental happenings, starting from an inferior condition and progressing to a superior one. And we'll get to that. In contrast, the biblical author affirmed that God intentionally and suddenly created the world. So evolution says that we came from monkeys. God says, "Uh uh-uh, I created you. You were walking, talking, and speaking, and you were smart when I did that. And if, if we were created from monkeys millions of years ago, where is the monkeys that are still evolving? Why aren't they still evolving? Why don't I, you see I know where evidence? They live. I know where they live. <laughs> but why don't we have any evidence, not just in the monkeys, but in anything? Why isn't the snail evolving into something different or why don't we see evidence of what it's going to be right and if we're still evolving where is our next step from our human where do we go next we're here we've been here and we're degrading as sin you know slowly erodes us but we're not getting better okay so he created us and he created the world There was nothing by chance about it. The world did not come about by itself, but only as a result of God's will and word. The word, the verb bara, create, translated in Genesis 1 as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, occurs only with God as its subject, and it denotes abruptness. God spoke, and it was so. By his word, he said it, and it was there. Chip. Yeah, that's that's that Hebrew word bahra, and another Hebrew word is asa. The word bahra is created out of nothing. The word asa is made. Okay, so God does both two things: He creates out of nothing, and He also creates by making. And in other words, for this is an instance of the word asa. When God formed Adam, He used dirt. And he formed the dirt, and he asad Adam out of the dirt. When he made Eve, he took a rib, something previously created. He took a rib out of Adam and formed around that rib the body of Eve, and he asad Eve. He made her. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he used something else that he previously had created out of nothing. Okay? It's just like when he, when he formed, when he created our planet, our living environment, it was, the earth was formless and void, but water encircled the whole earth, and it was, a, it was a large sea, okay? During creation week, he separated the seas from land, and then he created earth. Now, the, earth, the soil is what he created out of nothing, but the earth was already here, a planet. So, and those nutrients he put in the soil are something he made so that plant life would grow. These things he did that week. Thank you. So the creation text informs us that everything had been done then, Genesis 131, and according to the creator himself, it was all judged very good. So the very last 
um, in Genesis 1.31 says it was very good. And Genesis 1.1 states the event itself, the creation of heaven and earth. And Genesis 2.1 declares the, that event was finished. And it was all completed, including the Sabbath, <clears throat> in seven days. Excuse me. Okay, and I wanted to say what you said, we're saying here with the Creator. Um, I think that goes on to Wednesday's lesson. But again, he wanted an intimate relationship when he created us humans. And I want to cover that more. Um, we can move on to Sabbath, if nobody, or Tuesday's lesson, the Sabbath, if no one else has anything to say on Monday's lesson. Any questions? It says read, oh, Leonard. No? Oh. It says, read Genesis chapter 2, and I want to read 1 through 3. Two, one through three. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. And it says Exodus 20, 8 through 11, and we know that it covers it, the fourth commandment. But why is the seventh day Sabbath related to creation? Can anyone answer that? From the standpoint of our place in human history, <clears throat> we connect the Sabbath with creation and with redemption, but I think it's important to remember the Sabbath was created before the fall of man. I mean, God is all-knowing, so he knew this was going to happen, but the Sabbath was created as part of a perfect world. Mm -hmm. And it is a memorial of creation, as we're reminded in the fourth commandment. Mrs. White makes the statement that if the Sabbath had been faithfully observed, there never would have been an evolutionist, for example. Um, it's connected with salvation because we see that the, the creative power God exercised in creating this earth and man and so forth is also able to recreate us when we accept his gift of salvation. Um, but if we start trying to say the Sabbath was connected with both from the beginning, we run the danger of having someone look at the Sabbath as this part of the ceremonial law, which pointed forward to Jesus and then was no longer in effect after Calvary. So I think we need to remember that the Sabbath, according to the Bible, it's eternal. It says from one new moon to another and one Sabbath to another in the new earth that you know, all flesh will come together before God. Amen. Thank you. And so how does this connection impact how we keep the Sabbath? So it's a memorial to creation. You have six days plus one. And it's for us to have a physical and spiritual celebration of creation. It allows us, you know, God created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. And the very next day, the seventh day, was their day of rest to enjoy all that he created. It was a rest with him, too. Exactly, to be in spiritual they were They were literally with God, though, on the Sabbath. Yes. Literally face yes. to face. Yes. There was no sin that separated us from right. them. Right, yeah, and that's when God spoke and taught them in the, yeah. the, that Sabbath day they rested together. And that's why it's good to rest and to praise and worship God on the Sabbath day. We should be spending time with God because yeah. that was the original intent. And that's why what, what Leonard brought up, that throughout eternity into the future, all of mankind will come together on the Sabbath and worship God, yeah. fellowship with him. Exactly. I mean, us humans, and you can see the proof all around, 
we would work around the clock every day, you know, unless specified and by learning about the Sabbath to stop, smell the roses. We'd be working on a Saturday. We'd be working every day. It wouldn't be one special day set aside unless God had said, do it. The Sabbath is just another example of how amazing God is because he creates, he creates a unit of time which is totally arbitrary. We know that the year is defined by the earth orbiting the sun and the, the day is defined by the rotation of the earth and the moon has to do with the month and so forth. But the seven-day week was totally arbitrary and God created that unit of time in the beginning and seized from his work of creation so that man would have a special day to spend time with their creator, knowing that sin was coming, and after the fall, we would need that day of rest even more, because now we have to earn our bread by the sweat of our brow, and we get tired and worn out and stressed and all of that. At the same time, God resting from his work is um, a type of how we rest from our labors and trust in his salvation. We don't have any work to do to save ourselves. We rest in God's saving power. Amen. And we also need that rest for our bodies to heal, right? I mean, they say when you're sleeping, that's when your body heals because your body is resting. So on the Sabbath day, to have that day of rest, we can heal spiritually with our, you know, speaking with God and taking our special time with him, and we can heal physically, giving our body a break from working all the time. Okay? So it is precisely because God ended his work of creation that he instituted the Sabbath. The seventh-day Sabbath is therefore the expression of our faith that God finished his work then and that he found it very good. To keep the Sabbath is to join with God in the recognition and value and beauty of his creation. We can rest from our works just as God rested from his. Sabbath keeping means saying yes to God's very good creation, which includes our physical bodies. Contrary to some ancient and modern beliefs, nothing in scripture, Old or New Testament, denigrates the body as evil. That's a pagan concept, not a biblical one. God created us. He didn't create us evil. He created us perfect. Instead, Sabbath keepers are grateful for God's creation, which includes their own flesh, and that is why they can enjoy the creation and why they take care of it. The Sabbath, which marks the first end of human history, is also a sign of hope for suffering of mankind and the groaning of the world. It is interesting that the phrase, finished the work, reappears at the end of the construction of the sanctuary in Exodus 40.33, and again at the end of the building of Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 7.40.51 both places where the lessons of the gospel and salvation had been taught. After the fall, the Sabbath at the end of the week points to the miracle of salvation, which will take place only through the miracle of a new creation. That's Isaiah 65, 17, Revelation 21 and 1. Let's read that one. Revelation 21, 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So we know that God will have a new heaven and a new earth, and all old things are passed away. Even our old bodies will be passed away. We'll have new bodies. And so we'll have that rest in the new world, like Leonard said, all flesh will come before us to worship before the Lord and the new world. So the Sabbath is a sign at the end of our human week that the suffering and trials of this world will have an end as well, as in the millennial rest. And that is why Jesus chose the Sabbath as the most appropriate day to heal the sick. Isn't that an interesting concept? It's the truth. And he made a lot of Pharisees mad that he worked on the Sabbath, right? But it wasn't work. He was healing the sick and helping the sinner. 
So contrary to whatever traditions the leaders were stuck in by the Sabbath healings, Jesus pointed the people and us to the time when all pain, all suffering, all death will be over, which is the ultimate conclusion to the salvation process. Hence, each Sabbath points us to the hope of redemption. Amen. By resting on the Sabbath day, how are we experiencing the rest of salvation that we have in Jesus now and that which will be fulfilled ultimately in the creation of the new heaven and the earth? Anyone want to answer that one? No? How are we experiencing the rest and salvation that we have in Jesus now? By having a relationship with him? By learning to trust him? That what he says he will do. We learning more about him. You gotta speak in, yeah, learning more about him. I know but yeah. <laughs> We have the microphone because our online hearers can't hear yeah. your voice. Okay, you got to say it again. It is only put through the feed. Oh. To learn more about him. Yep, thank you. <laughs> That's why we have this, the microphone. <laughs> thank you, Barb. Yes, to learn more about him and to, to spend time with him. You know, to walk in the garden alone and, you know, as the dew is on the roses in the morning, you know. I mean, we have to have that relationship and prayer and, and learn who, who his voice is, who, who we... We need to have that relationship so that when he comes and calls us, we hear his voice. We know who he is. One other thing. Um, we, we come together on the Sabbath, and not only do we read and study God's word throughout the week, we come together for a whole hour, Sabbath morning, in church, and collectively we discuss God's word and what it tells us. So that's what helps to help us grow and understand and learn his word about what he is like. That's true. We, we, spend, we come to church and we spend an hour. But what I've, what I've learned is that it's not just an hour that I'm spending with God on the Sabbath where before when I was um, worshiping on Sunday and going to church, that was it. It was an hour of the day, maybe an hour and a half if I went to Sunday school. And then when that was done, it was done. You went home, you changed clothes, you did what you needed to get ready for the, the beginning of the week, you uh, get ready for work, you went out to eat. That was a big thing, too, after church. Everybody got together and went out to lunch. After that hour, my time with God was done, where I've learned now that it's not just that hour. When I leave here, then I go home and I read some more, or, my, or I go to my dad's and I help him out who's sick, or, or visit with someone that... I can share my my testimony with, but um, so that's where the difference is for me learning about the actual Sabbath and what it's for, other than just um, getting together with some friends and having a Bible study mm -hmm. for an hour and exactly. be done. And it isn't just like what you said for the Sunday keepers; they're one and done. But for when we learn about the Sabbath, it's refreshing us, it's uplifting us spiritually, it's giving us strength to face the week, because we have God every day. You know, we get up and, you know, we, we pray in the morning and we pray throughout the day. And, I mean, we're there throughout the week, right? And then on Sabbath, we also get to enjoy and rest. And, and God wants the whole day of Sabbath. He yeah. wants to fellowship with, with us that whole day long. Yeah, not just the hour. Specifically. Exactly, yeah. So Sabbath, there's a lot wrapped up in keeping the Sabbath. And it, it doesn't get studied enough, I think, especially in, in other churches. Yeah. Somebody had asked Jeff once when he was in the hospital, um, when, how do you know when Sabbath is done? Because they were doing the you know, sundown thing with him. And he said, and it will always stick with me, the Sabbath is over when you quit treating it like the Sabbath. That's when it's done. You keep God all the time. Yeah. It's a lot of truth to that. 
Leonard. So what you were saying is some Sabbath afternoons and into the evening, you can keep it beyond darkness. <laughs> you can keep enjoying that Sabbath relationship with God. And sometimes you don't want to stop. There was a time when people who kept Sunday kept it quite uh, sacredly and avoided work, you know, any unnecessary work. Um, now, there was probably a certain element of salvation by works in that, but I think it's interesting that Satan, first of all, managed to have the official church change the day over a period of time, and then he changed the way people looked at the day so that now, like the, somebody just said a few minutes ago, you know, you go to church on Sunday, and then you go home, and you, you go to a football game, or you go to the mall, or you go out to eat, or you do whatever, you know. It's uh, the Sabbath is over as soon as you get home from church. And then there's other people that, you know, don't even go to church except maybe Christmas and Easter. <laughs> so um, the devil manages to corrupt and uh, tear down every good thing God has given us. Yeah. It isn't just that hour that spent with God is over. It's like then God doesn't exist the rest of the week. Then you go about doing what you normally did before you went to church, and then you go next Sunday to ask for forgiveness for what you did all week, <laughs> and you're only spending one hour with God? You want to say something, Barb? Well, for me, um, having fellowship, and I like to come to church, and I come here now, and I know people where in the beginning I didn't, but it was still a wonderful place to be. So I think, you know, having fellowship, we strengthen one another and sometimes share um, you know, our faith or share what's happening or how God blessed us, um, those things are valuable. I think God, because God is a God who wants to be our friend at all times. And so to be friend with, friendly with one another, it helps all bring it together. Again, the God that created the heavens wants a relationship with us, and he spent a day or made a day for us to do that. That's how I was brought up, too, that on Sunday that we went to church. And it was just that hour that we would go, and then we'd go home, change clothes, yeah, eat dinner. And then the rest of the, the pastor never said that you were supposed to continue having a relationship, really, with God, like reading the Bible, doing stuff like that. It wasn't like that. I know now that it's, this is the way it's supposed to be, you know, but when you grow up like that, you don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And hopefully yeah. he winked at me. <laughs> He's yeah. winking at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, he did, does wink at us. Yeah. But it, see, it was Satan's idea right. to distort, distort the true Sabbath day right. by implementing a false one. And then he even destroys that false Sabbath day's experience with the people. Right. So who loses? The people lose. And that's what his, he's, you know, what he's you the deceiver. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what he wanted. Like I said to somebody a long time ago, I says, you, you expect to spend eternity with God in heaven, but you can't spend one day with him on earth. Amen. Right? There's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. People can't even spend one hour. How many don't even go to Sunday church for one hour? You know? It's sad. Any more comments? Leonard, no? Okay. I, I would like to just add that we... Before we be, a person becomes spiritually minded, he's lost. Not It wasn't a choice that he was lost. He was born that way. So when we as Christians, when we talk about the lost, is sad. It's sad that they are lost. It, so, you know, and that's why we do ministry and outreach is to, to witness to them that they have a God who loves them. You know, because they, if you if you're lost in the world, you have no idea what God is like. Mm -hmm. But when they're witness to, when they hear God's word, the scripture says, "By hearing, you become saved." Hearing God's word, so that's where we come in. Where we try our best to do outreach, and we should always be willing to do that to help those to understand. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. All right, we can move on to Wednesday's lesson: the creation of humanity. The creation of humans is God's last act of creation, at least in the Genesis account. Humans are the culmination of the whole earthly creation, the purpose for which the earth was made. So God made 
the earth for us humans. He had us in mind when he created the planet. And, you know, my daughter just got back from the Gulf course, Gulf, <laughs> Gulf Shores, and I'm looking at, you know, the beautiful ocean waves and the videos that she's sending and them having fun on the, on the sand and the palm trees. And, you know, to me, that's paradise. <laughs> you know, but then others look, you know, maybe from Africa, look at the woods that we have and the grass and they think that's paradise, you know. So we all have our own ideas of what paradise can be, but God created this planet for us to enjoy. He made it for us. And so in the Genesis account, one, chapter 1, 26 through 29, let's read that. Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 29. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Our likeness, that's more than one person. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he cre created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And that's a beautiful gift. He gave us this planet. So Genesis 2, 7. Oh, I got to read the last one. And God said, see, I have given you <clears throat> every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Let's go to Genesis 2, 7, one page over. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So what is the difference between when man was created compared to when everything else was created? Does anyone know? God spoke everything into existence. But when it came to man, he didn't just say, man appear, he actually formed us from the dust of the ground. Asa. Yeah. You know, I, I seen a video where it showed an, a God kneeling down and forming man from the dust and making out of clay, you know, starting with the head and the body and then breathing into him his spirit, his air, his breath, his ruach. How do you pronounce that word, ruach? Ruach, yeah, breath. And so breath was his spirit going in. And I think a lot of people misconceive when, when you die and your spirit goes out, they think that it's a living body thing that's going out with, with a, you know, a mind, but it's actually God's breath going back to him. It's not his spirit going out. This, we are the spirit. We are the living soul. So our soul doesn't leave us. It's the breath that leaves us when we die. It goes back to God. Leonard? While we're on Wednesday's lesson, I think we need to take note of the fact that God created male and female. He created Eve from a rib he took from Adam to signify that she was to stand by his side as an equal, not to be over him or trampled underfoot. And he intended that man and women, even though they were equal, should have certain roles. And Satan, again, has succeeded in totally distorting and, uh, you know, tearing that down. Um, we have the idea that um, you know a woman should be able to do anything a man can do so she can have exactly the same career and jobs and all this type of thing. And, of course, we know that marriage was one of the, the two big gifts from creation, marriage and the Sabbath, and Satan has perverted that to the point where, you know, our Supreme Court said it was legal some years back for two men to get married or two women to get married. 
but now they're going even further. A majority of, or at least a large number of people believe that, oh, you can't trust the gender you're born with. You've got to decide whether you're going to be male or female. It doesn't matter what God, how God created you to be, you know. And if you're not happy with it, well, you go have surgery and try to change it, you know. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. And, and God created woman as a helper to Adam. So she was to help Adam. And so she had qualities that, the same as Adam, maybe not as much, I don't know, but she definitely was a helper to him. He needed her. You know, he was lonely without her, everything else, you know. Yes, Kevin wants to. Just remember that Eve was not an afterthought. Yeah, it didn't come from a God slug. Had, God had <laughs> already decided to create Eve, and then he created Adam for Eve. Ah. Yeah, I, I just say I wouldn't downplay Eve's, you know, part in that in that union. And I think that's why it's very clear that it's talked about she coming from the cider, from the rib of Adam. So they were, you know, side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't um, a lesser person there. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I'm trying to finish reading this through here. That God has created humans in his image is one of the boldest statements of the Bible. Were you going to say something? Yeah, she said, anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> <laughs> I heard one a long time ago. Yeah. Should I say it or not? <laughs> sure, God created man before woman, but then you always have a rough draft before the final masterpiece. <laughs> And that God created humans in his image is one of the boldest statements of the Bible. Only humans have been created in the image of God. Though God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, God created man in his own image. This formula has often been limited to the spiritual nature of humans, which is interpreted to mean that the image of God is understood to signify only the administrative functions of representing God or the spiritual functions of a relationship with God or with each other. While these understandings are correct, they fail to include the important physical reality of this creation. Both dimensions are indeed included in the two words, image and likeness. Describing this process in Genesis 1.26, while the Hebrew word tselem, image, refers to the concrete shape of the physical body, the word demut, likewise, refers to the abstract qualities that are comparable to the divine person. Therefore, the Hebrew notion of the image of God should be understood in the holistic sense of the Bible view of human nature. The biblical text affirms that human individuals, men and women, have been created in God's image physically as well as spiritually. As Ellen G. White clearly comments, when Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. And isn't that going to be true when we go all go to heaven? What form does Jesus have? Human. He's not an angelic form. Yes. And he, that's why he's always been called God the Son. And uh, the Son of Man or the Son of God. It's always been his name throughout eternity past from ever since God was, which he's always been. There's been God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He has always looked forward to coming here, revealing himself in that human form. And just to repeat what you said, that Adam had a body, a mind, and a spirit. And you have God as, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's some similarities. Mm -hmm. So in fact, this holistic understanding of the image of God, including the physical body, is reaffirmed in the other creation account, which says that man became a living being. In 2.7, where, where it says here that man became a living being after um, God breathed nostrils of breath, or in his nostrils, the breath of life. Literally a living soul, as a result of two divine operations, God formed, God breathed. Note that the breath often refers to the spiritual dimension, but it also closely tied to the biological capacity for breathing. If we don't breathe, we're dead. So we need that air. 
The part of the man that was formed of the dust of the ground, it is the breath of life that is breath, spiritual, and life, physical. I mean, we can form things out of mud and blow on it. Are we going to bring it to life? No. No. So God will later perform a third operation, this time to create the woman from the body of man, a way to emphasize that she is of the same nature as the man. And what Kevin said, he came from the side to be equal to, and not look down on, like Leonard said. And we're out of time. We didn't get to Thursdays. I thought we were going <laughs> to. And so we'll end this lesson today with a prayer. I thank you all for all your help. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for showing us that you created us, that we didn't come from sludge, that you gave us a mind and a heart to love you. And so I just want to say thank you for this new lesson that we're going into study in Genesis. And I look forward to it. Thank you again for the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.